Coolers, and our artists. The last one is Mike and Swain. So in our history, that's very rare and it says a lot about your work. So we're very pleased to have you here tonight. Thank you for your wonderful talents. And I will turn the stage over to you all.
foundation, becoming an artist, art school, all those good things. So um, to quote the curator and entrepreneur Dexter Wimberly from his essay in Black Abstractionists for the Green Family Art Fund in Dallas, he states, um, or he claims, let's say, abstraction is one of the most radical forms of art requiring courage, focus, self-awareness, ambition, wherein primary interest is in the materiality of paint, relating to intuitive improvisation. The artist is tuned into an internal logic, including deep personal narratives and mythologies, holding the tension between order and chaos, holding spaces for contemplation. Um, so, did you come to know abstract art first in Philadelphia, where you were born? Um, I, yes, I, I did. You know, I started off in um, high school doing a lot of photography. So I think I was like, like maybe training myself to see things in a like formal, like I was always framing things and approaching things like through a frame. So I think when I went to art school and then did other art, but I think I, I did come from like an academic drawing the figure background. I sort of like already trained my eye maybe through photography. Mm -hmm. So, and I think of that as sort of extra. Okay. Interesting. All right. So, do you, um, so Philadelphia basically formed you as an artist? Yeah. I mean, Urban I was and there. Okay. And, and like when I did photography, I was, did a lot of outside. So, growing up in Philadelphia, can you describe how that was for you? Uh, how you think the city might have formed you as an artist? I mean, is that... Well, I guess just, I mean, I was exposed to being close to New York. I could go to New York when I was in, in high school. And, you know, I went to all the museums in Philadelphia, even as a young person in elementary school, they took us to the art museums. And I just... There's a lot of information you get living in the city. Mm -hmm. So, and there's just the, the culture of the city is sort of part of your, I don't know, this part of who you are, it's like in part of wherever you're from. So both exposure to so much, and then also just the, the high energy, like, you know, there's a lot going on. Also, I went to school downtown for a while, like mm -hmm. after two years of high school, so I, I had a lot of, well, So, um, did you attend an arts-focused school? Well, I went to Philadelphia College of Art, and now it's called the University of the Arts, and I went to a graduate school to Art Institute in Chicago. But when you were, I'm sorry, I'm going, yeah. I'm way back. I'm not No, that's okay. So, when you were younger, like elementary school, were you in an arts-focused school, or in high school, no, was it an arts was, school? No, I was in an arts-focused school. Okay, gotcha. Um, and then, were your parents particularly art-focused? My father liked to make collages, and I think that really influenced me when I was younger. We have seen him make collages when I was, you know, maybe a toddler. And he, you know, he didn't, he didn't, he wasn't a full-time artist, but he did a lot of, like, to make art. And my mother liked to hang paintings, so she would be the person who would go to someone's house and hang their paintings. And she liked to rearrange things, and so she didn't make art, but she was interested in moving pictures around and yeah. hanging them up. Okay, that's interesting. Um, are there any particular exhibits or experiences growing up in the early years that just, you know, really stood out? Well, there was like a pop art exhibit at the Philadelphia Museum of Art that really made a big impression on me. I don't know if I was like in seventh grade, but there was a Lucas Samaras Mirrors thing, and there was just, that, that was one that really impressed me. It's like an infinity mirror. Mm -hmm. So that show just really stood out. I don't know what the name of it was, but I remember it being sort of like a pop art. Yeah. So you've been drawn to pretty experimental work in some ways. Well, I mean, I like a lot of work, but I mean, I know, what I'm saying is I didn't come in and like, no one ever said this is the beginning. It's right. like I just came in and got exposed to a lot of things. So really quickly, we're going to talk about the photography that you were doing. So can you describe 
your approach to that? Because there's so many different ways. I mean, you, it's not, I don't have a sense that you were taking the portrait of a child. Well, I, I like to go out in my in the different neighborhoods, like some right where I live, and I would just take pictures of people's houses and people on the street. And was, I mean, I probably, I think I took pictures of my family, but mostly I just like to walk around and take pictures. And it was, you know, I had a regular camera back then. Gotcha. Um, so what brought you to ultimately move towards painting? Well, when I was, um, you know, when I went to college, the Philadelphia College of Art, this is a foundation year, and you have to take, everyone takes the same program, so you have to do 2D, 3D drawing, design. So I got exposed to a lot of 2D drawing and painting, and I still wanted to be a photography major, but then once I was in the photography department, I started painting on my photographs, and that was sort of traditional photography department, and they didn't they didn't want me to do that there. So then, then I became like a fibers major, or maybe I was undeclared, and then I was a fibers major doing sculpture, and that wasn't really fitting in. And I was doing like mixed media, so finally I ended up in the painting department where they said, you know, I can do whatever I wanted, and then I started painting. So, and then I really liked painting, so I just kept painting. That's great. I love that. They let me do whatever I want, so I stay here. That was a smart move. We are really appreciative that you decided to go in that direction. Well, um, let me think here. Is there, do you have any initial professors or colleagues or anybody that kind of let you know that you were going in the right direction? Or was it just like, I just have liberty, so I'm sticking with well, I think my photography teacher, who was sort of well known, he's, when I told him I was going to go in the painting department, he said, well, that's a good idea. And then also I had like Larry Day, who's a really great um, drawing instructor at the Philadelphia College of Art, and Warren Moore. Those are the two teachers that really, you know, were important to me as an undergraduate. They're both Philadelphia-based painters. Okay. And then, um, so you went to graduate school in Chicago. How was that moving? Well, that was, that was hard, you know, it's like harder, you know, it wasn't like New York, this was the Midwest, it was like not, it wasn't New York City, it was like a different kind of city, but, you know, I, I got a lot out of being there, there's a lot of galleries and museums and other students, and so it's definitely, it was like worthwhile. Oh, for sure, yeah, so, no doubt, right. Um, what was different about the experience of being in Chicago in graduate school than undergraduate? Is there anything can you Yeah, it seems a lot harder, you know, every in Philadelphia everything's very close. It's a small downtown, you're walking everywhere. And Chicago's not the same kind of walkable city. It's like you're downtown and people live all over the place. It's not like you have a little community. Mm -hmm. And it's just it seemed harder to get around in the winters. I started in I started in the middle of the semester in January. <laughs> it was really cold. Like, what have I done? You know, it's just a different city. It wasn't like the kind of city I was used to. Right, I gotcha. Okay. Um, well, I'm just gonna move on a little bit. So, so relocating and establishing your practice in Louisiana. So, so basically, you're a big city girl, and you go to another big city, and you're <clears throat> focused, you know, on path of being an artist, and then you arrived in Shreveport in 1987? Yes. Was that true? Yes. So I, I thought I was only going to be here for two years, but it turned out to be longer. <laughs> so, you know, it, I did, do try to go to Dallas. It's like, you know, that's like a close city, so mm -hmm. it's like three hours. So. so backing up just a tiny bit, so, um, so you arrived here thinking you're going to be here for two hours. Two, two. Two years, sorry. <laughs> sorry, that was, yeah. Mm -hmm. Freudian slip there, apparently. Um, were you surprised to be here? Well, it's, at first I thought it was like an adventure, but you know, it was like a sort of a cultural shock. Yeah. You know, it was like different. I, I um, can only imagine. And you know, also it was more isolating back then. There was no internet, no cell phone. So if you wanted to go, there was no bookstore. So if you wanted to go to a bookstore, I mean, I think there was a little bookstore on the way up, but if you wanted to go to a bookstore with a lot of art books, you had to like go to Houston or Dallas. Or right. 
So it was like I felt sort of out of touch. And I think you had mentioned that um, when you moved here, it was right like the peak of the oil crash. Oh yeah, it was like there was a lot of us. empty stores, and a lot of ha streets were multiple houses were for sale, and it was sort of you know it was like Philadelphia was going through this boom. I'm not and it's not that it always was going through boom, but it was like I was living in Philadelphia, it was like a boom. And down here, it was like, this, everything was really, you know, this it was transition. Hard time, right? It was yeah. well, it was a transition, sure. So, um, when you got out of graduate school, what were your thoughts, like, when I'm done, where were, where were you going? Or well, I, I was trying to save money to move to New York. That was my goal. Okay. And then um, the stars aligned, was like Cupid, you know, smacked you in the somewhere and so you ended up here and so um i guess my question is uh how did so you you had these sort of big expectations or just dreams or desires and you end up here and so i guess the question is what kind of adjustments did you make did, we all kind of do this right it's like okay i'm going to be here for a while so i'm going to i'm going to make this work for me in some way so what well, this isn't really about being here, but I did really like learning, going to Fort Worth and going to those museums that I'd never been to before. And, and sometimes we drive to New Mexico and like, I'd never been in the Southwest. So there were like new things I was doing that like I was like happy about doing. Yeah. Um, so you had just like so, really this whole cultural exposure you know, to... I, I, you know, I, I didn't really mind being exposed to different things than just being on the East Coast. Yeah. Okay. You know, but it's just being, not being in cities, I thought was challenging as an artist. Yes, yeah, especially before all of, all that is now, right? Um, so how, how did you continue to produce this whole time? Like when you got here, was it just like? I think I was doing a lot of work until I had my second child, mm -hmm. okay. and then I really slowed down for. I, I think like almost really. I mean, I did a little, but it, I sort of had to start over, mm -hmm. you know, after my kids were like in elementary school. I mean, I felt like I was starting over because I was doing so a lot of work, mm -hmm. and even through having one child, but then having two child, two children was, you know, but yeah, you know, I like made my way back. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. you made your way back with the vengeance. Yeah. That I would say for sure. So, um. <clears throat> I don't know if you can even answer this question, but in hindsight, can you see any benefits to being located here? Well, <laughs> well the thing is, like, look, I'm having this, this show here. That's definitely a benefit. I mean, you know, you could live in a big city and, and you know, you have a very small spaces that you're showing it in. Just, I don't know. I mean, this is like a great thing. And I, and I had a gallery in Dallas, and, you know, you just, it's hard to, I don't know what the question is, but it's hard to okay. know what was going to happen if you did something else. Right, if you go to New York. Then, and you know, know, I mean, it's sort of been great there too, but it's just, that's not, it's yeah. hard to hear that now. I am not a big fan of all diverse either, so we'll just stick with the one that we've got. Okay, so um, <clears throat> another quote is, you know, that's who I am as an art historian. Arthur, uh, excuse me, Arthur and cultural critic Rebecca Solnit from her essay on women's work and the myth of the art monster, creativity and advocacy are no more or less selfish than motherhood. That's a title. Anyway, said this, art making is often solitary, usually introspective and sometimes personal. Even though the artist creates out of a deep solitude, he or she or they generally make art because there is a desire to say something to other people by way of offering pleasure or new insight into the familiar visions of the unfamiliar or perspectives on the world and our psyches that make the world new and strange and worthwhile again. Creating work, uh, creating is work that can hold up its head with all of the kinds of useful work out there in the world and it is genuinely work. So, do you have any thoughts about that work? They just work. Maybe you ask me like a specific question. So, have you ever had to explain yourself as an artist? Yeah, people, you know, ask me to different things. 
Yeah. So people are like, what do you do? And you're like, I'm an artist. And then they go, what? Well, it just depends, like, if someone, what the assignment is one when they ask you if they, if they have to really, uh, like, to become familiar with art, then they're asking a specific yeah. kind of question. And then if they don't, if it's sort of foreign to them, then it's like a different kind of question. So it's like you have to answer a person from, you know, what level of information they want. That's true. That's true. Okay. Um, sorry about the long quote. I'll try to keep them not so long. But anyway, you know, working with you now, um, you know, I have known you to always be working. Uh, just always working. Learning, expressing yourself in a way that is dynamic and energetic. Um, your paintings pulse with a sense of movement. You're extremely dedicated and committed to your work. And though you have been in some manner of exile, um, from where you grew up, right here in a new place. Your works are clearly in communication with the broader world of art. I mean, you've managed to make it work in many ways, right? And you've had exposure around um, the country, even Italy, so anyway. But um, I would say your context uh, goes far beyond your location and geography. Does that make sense to you? Well, you know, it's really important for me to go see other arts. So it's like once I got to the point in my life where I could stop going to New York again, then just go to galleries. I really tried to go like twice a year. Once, you know, my life was settled enough that I could do that and try to go to Texas a lot to see art. And that really like makes me feel like more connected mm -hmm. to just go and see art and try to go to galleries. And, so and then you know the, in having the internet, I learned about so many artists once Facebook and Instagram started. I mean, so much exposure to art. It's like so much extra painting, so much great work. I mean, just and like I sort of developed like the people my like it's like a big thing exposed to your peer group. It's like people my age, people close to my age. All these years, maybe our experiences were similar, even though I wasn't in the East Coast, but like our backgrounds are similar, and now I'm seeing all this work. So that's been like so great for me. Yeah. Just having, you know, the internet. Absolutely. So oh, yeah, I'm sure. Well, um, so I was reading this. Um, there is a endowed chair at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago, and she was talking about what makes a really strong artist. She said the artist exudes an energy of creativity, reads books, what makes, um, sorry, does research, constantly works, experiments, works on the cutting edge while at the same time understanding history, seeks out inspiration, is passionate about art, design, music, food, and film, has an inner strength, a fearlessness, and a desire to push forward. So when I read that, when I read it, excuse me, I thought of you. Oh, and so I guess the question is, do you think this, do you think this of yourself? Do you recognize that? I, I mean, I think you know, it's when you read it, it's hard to focus. But I think I looked at that a little bit before. But I think I like the photo. Yeah. I like the debate to it. Yeah. So, I mean, for sure. Anyway, I would say yes. But you can comment on that. So, um, having worked with you, I have seen just a mere sliver of your art library. And I would say it's probably one of the best I've ever seen. I'm really, I'm, I'm very jealous. I walk around and I go, I wonder if I could just take like 12 of those. But anyway, so I guess my question is, how important are books to your practice? Well, you know, our books. Well, I love books. And even when I was in high school, I had a, it wasn't one of my books, but it was, I had a gigantic library. I mean, I was like, I had a library in my room. And now I have a library in my house. So I have a lot of books, and I just love books. And it also, you know, it like makes me feel like, you know, like closer to everything if I'm like, have a lot of art books to look at and other books to read. I'm just like one of those book people. I love a book person. Yep. Angie, you're a book person. Probably most of your book people. Molly, I know. Okay, anyway, I'm not going to call it all the book people. So, um, when did you know you were getting some traction? I guess you could say. Well, I guess when I started, like I think in 2005, to, I started showing at Mary Tomas Gallery in Dallas. And so that made me feel a lot better. Even though I think I had shown like maybe a little bit in New Orleans and Philadelphia, but I mean being here for a long time, and that made me feel, you know, it's like 
And my work was seen, like regularly being shown to larger audience. So I was like happy about that. So being represented by a gallery, was it, um, I mean, what did it do for you specifically? I don't know. Well, I saw some work, but also like, you know, I could go to the openings and I'd meet a lot of people and they'd see my work and I could talk to people at the openings and yeah. you know, they could come back and see it again and they could see work in other shows. So that's just like a good feeling. So it just had a lot of, it also, it sounds like it was kind of like developed a whole new community and there was a lot of dialogue going on. Yes, um, but yeah. you know, but I just like it's just nice to, you know, there's like we're a place where there's foot traffic where people are going to discover your work maybe and. Mm -hmm. you know, and Mary Thomas's gallery is no longer. Well, they they closed during the pandemic. Okay. So, okay. Um, this is a silly question, but how many versions of your artist statement have you written over the years? Well, you know, like this is. When I applied to graduate school, I had to have a, a state. And like, you know, I worked really hard on it. I had people read it. And then, in my mind, like, there was no artist statement until like, later. It's like, I don't remember that being a requirement until like, I had to like, come back into the art world in the like, 90s or whatever. And then all of a sudden, or late 90s. I don't know. Like, I don't remember always having to have an artist statement. Now we have to have an artist statement. And it's not had like a couple, but basically I'm just whatever I started off with, like when I had my website, it's I guess maybe it's been like twelve or fifteen years. So I'm just sort of reworking my artist state my artist statement from like ten years ago. I changed it, but it's still basic because a lot of my ideas are basic. Yeah. So Okay. Well so that's a good segue into um you know, one of the things working with you, which is so great, is that you have, I mean, I hate to say the word brand, because it's just what it looks, but what I'm saying is that you have this very consistent aesthetic in everything you you have put your fingers on. I mean, as far as any of the website, any of the postcards that go out, anything that, you know, I mean, you send these things out, I'm like, oh, it's done, you know? I mean, your work might change, but the, the frame around it is the same, like, you know, it's very clean, it's very modern, it's very, you know, sort of sparse, let the art stand out. So I guess my question is, how did that come about? Because, I mean, it's a, it's a good plan. And, well, and by the way, let me just say that Casey picked up on it so beautifully and, and carried it through, so thank you, Casey, for where you are right now. Well, I don't really think it was a, a, a really planned. It's like, I had a designer help me make my first postcard, and I think, Maybe for, I don't, I'm just going to make it up. It's like years of, like maybe for the last 15 years, I've been sending out postcards every year. And, and we just had, she developed like a, I probably told her what I like. And so we, then we had a format. So we just kept using the same format. It's like I send her the image and mm -hmm. she just puts everything in the same place. And then with my website, you're just probably like, I want it. You know, I think I've changed my website like five times. But again, I try, I like my own ideas, like I like it to be as simple as it can be. Mm -hmm. And um, that's just what, like, what I like. Yeah. And it's really, I mean, it made it so easy for how we proceed to build the shows. I mean, thank you. Like, to me, I, just, to me, it's just basic. Yeah. But, but it's beautiful. Yeah. It's, it's a nice aesthetic, I would say. How many of you get Helen's cards in the room? Anybody? Anybody? How excited are you when you get one of those in the room? I mean, I'm always just like, whoop! Yay! Anyway, okay. So, um, all right, moving on. Let's talk about your process. I'm going to read into the book. Here we go. Oh my God. Um, artist Joseph Almer said, states in Interaction of Color, in visual perception, a color is almost never seen as it really is, as it physically is. This fact makes color the most relative medium in art. Each color evokes immeasurable readings. It is affected by interaction of colors and by response to colors. An eye for color equals seeing the color action as well as feeling the color relatedness. Seeing what happens between colors is what counts. Not the what of the color, but the how. So obviously I would say to everyone in the room, color is um, a big focus of your work. So can you talk about 
I mean, as an artist, I don't think color, like color is different in each painting. Right. I so, think one time you were talking about how people put so much on color, but it doesn't, you, you kind of, you reject that idea that it carries certain significance. Well, I mean, it, it, like I'm only talking about it as a painter. Right. So it's like maybe as a writer or as like a cultural person just thinking about color, different colors in, in a cultural in a fashion or something else, there might be a reason to have more like something with color. But for me, it doesn't work. It doesn't work. I got you. Okay. Um, so how are we doing on time? Somebody tell me because I have no clue. 6 Okay. We started at 545. Oh, okay. Let me. Okay. Um, I think we probably talked a little bit. Okay. That's good. All right. So, um, Daryl Ratcliffe, an artist, poet, and cultural organizer, and visual arts reporter for the Dallas Morning News, in his essay on a recent show called Considering Female Abstraction, wrote. Abstraction is a very hopeful form of painting. It centers on the belief that an artist can take the immaterial and capture it in some way on a canvas. This is a daunting task for an artist. It is one thing to paint a bowl of fruit and quite another to paint how a bowl of fruit makes one feel. It is also a bit daunting for the viewer. There is a process to both the creation and understanding of abstraction and the process is the point, and the point is freedom. I know, another long quote. Does that make sense to you? I, I think when I read that earlier, I liked it. <laughs> but now that you've read it, no, you've read it. No, but I hear you, when I hear you read it, it's hard. I'm not sure what I'm used to. Okay. I have a comment. All right. Um, all right, so I've known your work for, um, you know, more than two decades. I've seen your paintings grow in size and complexity. And for me, it's been incredibly rewarding knowing how your work has developed over the years. The newest collection of paintings feels so liberating and viewing them is a liberating experience for me. So you seem to be, in this body of work, you seem to be sort of unapologetically Ellen Song. Like, I don't know what it is to me, but this new body of work seems like you busted through a door, a gateway, a something. Does anybody, who else has been following Ellen's work all these years? So, does anybody else get that? Am I off? Okay. All right. So we'll continue for just a minute, and then somebody has to say 
Okay, this is your sign. If you do it all together, that'd be really fun for us. Okay. So, um, I have a question. In developing the press materials for this exhibit, um, the terms joyful and fun came up. And you were resistant to that. And so, which is, I'm not complaining about that. I'm just curious about that. Where, what do those words mean to you and how, why do you not want them associated with your work? I know, when people tell me a lot of times it's so much fun and joyful, I look, it's like I can see it, but somehow I don't feel that. So it's like, I, it's like I can't join a conversation about that that easily because, and I'm not saying I don't have like a lot of exuberance when I'm doing it, but somehow there's something else in there for me. So that was, go ahead. That, that's sort of like not, Joyful, and it's not any joyful. It's just something else. It's not not joyful, but it's not joyful. I guess it's, 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 it's just okay. not. It's just not my experience. So I was wondering if somehow those terms feel denigrated or dismissive to what you're doing. Like it's like, oh, it's so much yeah. fun. Helen's in her studio. Yeah, it's so much fun. And she's like, oh my god, I'm trying to get it perfect. You know. Yeah, maybe it just seems. Like lighthearted, whereas like the whole experience, the whole process seems so much more work than just joy. Right. So that might be, yeah, it's like, yeah. I don't know. Would you concede that your work is exuberant? Yes, I'll, I'll show it now. You'll take exuberant. <laughs> okay, excellent. We've come to a conclusion here. Okay. Um, what? Uh, what does it mean to you to have this kind of support for this exhibition? Oh, I'm just, I'm really happy about this show. I mean, it's, you know, it's like we had a professional installer, and then Kelly has worked so hard on the show, and all this art, art space, and then a catalog, and I mean, it's just been really awesome. We've been you know, all this out there. There have been films. And then just having the opportunity to have all this work together, I mean, I just, you know, it's just such a rare opportunity. And then to go back to my studio, I'm really interested how I'm going to process having all my work out of my studio, because also I can see it so much better. I mean, like, I, I never had this kind of distance to see the big paintings. Like, I just thought this painting was so dark. Like, I've always thought of it as, like, totally navy blue. Because I guess it was like, look. But now it's like, oh, the so it's like, it's just such a different paint. Like, the paintings look really different to me, and I can really see them. So, you know, I, I really like that. It's incredibly valuable. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, so, can you see connections uh, for your work in the broader contemporary art world? Well, I mean, you know, it's like I have my own personal feelings when I see things, but. I just don't really see that it's my like job to like define that. Like I would like other people like you and like people who write about my work and they can find all the connections and like you yeah. know make it like uh, this is the connections. Whereas like my connections are more like an emotional kind of like I'll see something and I'll feel attracted to it. But you know, I don't really, it doesn't always mean that our work has any, my work has anything in common with the things I like. Sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. And I'm just going based on my gut feelings. I like this, I like that. So the value of other people writing about your work, Catherine, is very important, right? And those of you who in the audience who do write, you know, we need more people talking about the art we have here. We really need diver, I mean, there's no, nothing stopping us, right? You know, I mean, nowadays we can all just put out whatever we want. So, anyway, I, I think that that is a, something that we can improve upon. Um, the other day you mentioned that on March 4th, Jerry Salt, a um, senior art critic for the New York Magazine and author tweeted, artists, do not ask what a work of art means. Ask what a work of art does to you. Art is not a thing or a noun. Art is a verb. Art is something that does something to you. So you brought that up to me, and I was wondering, what does that mean to you? 
and um, oh, I like Bryce Martin too, and um, Robert Ryman. I like the Tees and Picasso and Cezanne, like sort of classic modernism. I mean, I like them so much. I like Mondrian, I like, you know, kind of just, well, I like Francis Bacon. I'm reading the autobiography, even though I don't really know how it relates to my work. spend I don't know how many years photographing yes, your work you. and watching it evolve. And it seems to have evolved in this direction. Is that correct? Yeah, this is one of the later paintings. Well, for this that year. blows my mind. Oh. And I'd, I'd like to ask how many, raise your hand if you're an artist in here. And there's a lot of artists, and I'll tell you what, every one of these people with their hands up love you and love your work and are Thank here to support. first layer. But usually, a lot of times there's nothing left over from the first layer. 
but every once in a while there is like something left. Hi, I'm so enjoying the show. I'm okay. grateful that Art Space was able to hear about. My question is, um, how did you begin developing the framework that is evident in all of You mean like that outer frame? Oh, oh yeah, they, they all yeah. have some sort of framework, whereas your earlier work was just the color, you know, textured color fields. You know, I think when I was younger, I, I like experimented more with like a framing device. And so it's something that like I sort of like and I just started putting it back in. I, I, something must have like made me think about it and I put it back in. And, and sometimes I just I don't I just don't like the way it, it goes off to the end. And so like making or framing is like just there's something that like feels right. It's I don't know, it doesn't have to be in every painting.
situated in the gallery space with the paintings, it's going to be a great conversation. Um, that week, the gallery will be closed on Tuesday to get set up. But anyway, so March 22nd and 23rd, you definitely want to come out. Um, this will be brought to you by the Shreveport Garden Club, uh, Study Club, excuse me, Shreveport Garden Study Club. Um, and it promises to be really incredible. Uh, and lastly, if you have not left it from me, some of you may have something else to say. Um, if you haven't already done so, you can tell Pepito's is kicking tail over there, and so I encourage you to go and enjoy their culinary delights. You'll be glad you did. So, um, I guess in closing, what I'd like to say is your work, your works, Ellen, this is where I get one-on-one -on -one with you. Your works have a deeply personal visual vocabulary, unique to you. It is a pleasure to celebrate that here in this exhibition. It is a, I'm not going to say joy. It is <laughs> delightful. Uh, anyway, it is really rewarding to spend time with your work. And I have had the last nine months to spend with your work in a more intimate way than I ever thought possible. So um, thank you for your candor tonight and for your generosity as you continue to work. And, Cannot wait to see what's next.